Let's talk about rotation curves. Rotation curves are important because they allow us to deduce how much mass and where the mass is in galaxies that rotate. So let's get to that conclusion step by step. First, let's look at a very simple example of a rotating object. I'm going to turn on this buzzer. It's slightly annoying. This shows us the Doppler shift. Okay, notice the change in pitch was quite large when it was going around very fast and small when it was going around slowly. So this is how we use to determine speeds in astronomy with the Doppler shift, with light instead of sound, of course. Another thing to notice about this system, I encourage you to try it at home. Put anything on a string and whip it around really fast and do it more slowly and you'll notice that you need to exert more force to keep it moving around really fast. And so this is a very general statement. When we see things moving around quite slowly, we can conclude that there is a relatively small amount of force on them compared to things that are moving uh, around quickly around the same central object. Now let's think about that in the context of gravity, where gravity is providing the, f the force that keeps it from flying apart instead of a string. Remember that the force of gravity depends on how much mass is in the center and the distance that you are from that mass. So if we see something orbiting rather slowly, we can conclude that it must be rather far away where the force of gravity is weak or there's not much mass in the center. So let's see how that applies to the solar system. Well, 99.9% .9 of the mass in the solar system is right here in the sun. So we're not gonna worry about mass for the moment. Let's just worry about how far each planet is from that central mass. And we've got an observer down here. So the planets are going around like this. We're looking at a top-down view right now on the whiteboard. And let's start with Pluto. Let's pretend Pluto is still a planet. Okay, and we're gonna plot velocity versus distance from the center of the sun. Pluto is quite far away, feels a weak gravitational acceleration to the sun, so it's moving quite slowly. Uranus is only half the distance from the sun, so it feels a stronger acceleration and has to go at a faster orbit. Jupiter feels even a stronger acceleration and goes on even a faster orbit, and so on. We can connect these dots, and it's going to look something like this. This is called a Keplerian rotation curve because it simply follows Kepler's laws. Now on the other side, these planets are coming towards the observer. So Neptune is going to have a rather small velocity, but of the opposite direction than Pluto had. Saturn is going to have a somewhat higher velocity, and Mars an even higher velocity, but all in this other direction compared to the first three planets we looked at. So that part of the rotation curve goes like that. Now, what do you think happens in the middle? Well, if you can imagine being right at the center of the sun, there's no net gravitational pull on you. There's a lot of mass near you, but it's pulling you in all different directions, so the net force is zero. So we know this line has to go through zero. And in fact, we don't observe this, but we can work out the equations that it goes something like this. And this shows that when you're on a falling rotation curve, these points where the rotation is getting closer to zero as you go farther out, they're all outside the distribution of mass. When you're inside the dis distribution of mass, the rotation curve is not falling. It's either rising or flat. So that's really important when we get to galaxies. And just before we get to galaxies, let's just give one other example. If the sun became very large in size, but keeping its same mass, how would the rotation curve be different? Well, for the distant planets, it can't matter at all because they're the same distance away from the same mass. But if you were to get inside the distribution of mass, uh, you would no longer be on the declining part of the rotation curve. So the net result is that the part of the rotation curve that's rising or flat is now going to uh, take up more of this plot if the sun is bigger. All right, now let's move to galaxies. Let's put a galaxy up here. And I'll plot the rotation in red. And what we observe is, sure enough, a rising rotation curve when we're inside the distribution of mass here. And starts to flatten out 
in both directions. Now the really cool thing is that we never actually see it fall. This rotation curve stays flat no matter how far out you go. And that indicates that no matter how far out you go, uh, you're still inside the distribution of mass. And that's really interesting. If you even look at it completely outside the distribution of stars, you'll find that it's still, according to this argument, inside the distribution of mass. And that indicates that the mass is really distributed quite differently from the light and the center. Now, dark matter. We can also use this rotation curve to look at the total amount of mass. And even in the center, where there's a lot of light, it turns out that there's more mass than you would guess, just based on looking at how much light there is, inferring how many stars that corresponds to, and knowing the mass of a typical star. So we conclude that there's dark matter uh, everywhere throughout this galaxy, but much more of it is on the outskirts than you, would, uh, you get an impression of based on looking at the light. And slightly more complicated arguments involving orbits indicate that this dark matter is in a spherical halo. It's not in a flat disk as the light in the galaxy is.